Well, thanks, Gerald, for the really kind uh, introduction. Bounce pass received. I'm going to see if I can uh, go up and thunder dunk this thing here uh, over the course of the next few minutes. I'm going to share my screen here and move us into a little PowerPoint. Well, I'm truly honored to be speaking with you all this morning, but I need to confess something right off the bat, which is I have no idea what I'm doing here. I mean that in two senses. First of all, just looking back at the people who have spoken in this space uh, over the, the previous month, I think to myself, I don't know what I'm doing here. These people are superstars. Um, I don't belong in this crowd. But it's also true in another sense. I have no idea what I'm doing here uh, because I've never had an opportunity to address the full community at Gordon before. Like Daryl said, I was a student for four years. I've now been working here for 10 years. Uh, and this is the first time I'm doing this. Uh, so realizing that, I immediately thought, well, who can I copy? The first person that came to mind was, was Dr. Dr. Harkaway Krieger. She gave a wonderful address in this space a few years ago. So I thought, okay, let me go to Dr. Harkaway Krieger. Let me see if I can copy her. One problem, her address was on childbirth. I was immediately ruled out um, in terms of following her topically, but I thought maybe I can at least get a sense for how many words equates to how many minutes. I should try to be on time when I speak. So Dr. Harkaway Krieger gave me a little formula and I'm hoping that our English professors are good at math or else we might be stuck here for some time. I scripted out my remarks uh, I, a couple of nights ago uh, I was at home and I practiced them and I realized this is not going very well. Uh, I saw myself on the camera. I didn't like what I saw. So I reached out to someone else, uh, to my current pastor and the former dean of chapel here, uh, Greg Carmer. And I said, Greg, how do you do this? This seems exceedingly difficult. Uh, and Greg said, well, you know, Zoom's a different space. Uh, maybe you should think about doing an outline, going a little more off the cuff. And then he proceeded to tell me that he would write his remarks out word for word and memorize paragraphs. And as soon as he said the word memorize, I said, I'm going to go with the off the cuff thing. So again, we're going to see how that works this morning. I now had a plan for how I was going to address everybody, but I was still searching for a start. Uh, sometimes starting is the hardest part. And I thought back to one more of these convocation or chapel addresses, I'm not sure which, that I remembered and that made an impression on me. And that was my former boss, Mark Sargent, who used to be the provost at Gordon. Uh, I looked at our current convocation theme. I saw that it had something to do with kingdom living. And I remembered that Mark gave a really lovely address. Um, it was on a series where the prompt was, the kingdom is dot, dot, dot. And then each different successive speaker would fill in what they thought the kingdom was like. Uh, Mark started his address by saying the kingdom of God is like a poem, or perhaps the kingdom is like reading a poem together. Mark is one of the absolute smartest people I know. So I thought I'm gonna do what he did. Let's start with a poem. In January of 2017, a Gordon chum sent me this poem completely out of the blue. Uh, it's called At North Farm by the late American poet, John Ashbery. And I wanna share with you just the first stanza. It's a two stanza poem, it's not long, but I'd like to start with just the first here. I'm gonna read it to you. Somewhere, someone is traveling furiously toward you at incredible speed, traveling day and night through blizzards and desert heat across torrents through narrow passes. But will he know where to find you, recognize you when he sees you, give you the thing he has for you? So I fudged a little bit at the beginning. I do have a little sense for how I got here, what I traveled through to come before you today. I still don't know what I'm doing, but I know a little bit about how I got here. It's because it's a really joyous occasion uh, in my life. I have a book coming out. And in fact, just earlier this week, we just received the author copies. I can hold this thing in my hand and it feels both surreal and very real at the same time. So it's this joyous occasion. I have a wonderful co-author. His name's Graham Honecker. Uh, he works at Butler University. And has become a dear friend to me through this whole process. Graham is a genius in so many ways. And one of the ways is promotion. And Graham would tell me, hey, we've got to promote the book. And I would say, how do you do that? And he would say, you just ask. And so I asked, could I speak at a convocation? And they said, yes. 
So I do know that that's how I got here. Um, I've learned a lot through this process of writing a book. As I mentioned, one of the things I learned is that you need to promote yourself. One of the things I've also learned is that I'm not very good at promotion. Case in point, I should be talking to you about the book this morning. I should be, I think, sharing some of the best stories from the book, really piquing your curiosity, maybe even getting you to go buy a copy of the book. And I'm not gonna do that. I am gonna share a story, uh, a story that's really important to me, but it's not from the book. Uh, it's related, but it's not in there at all. You don't have to buy anything. There's no cost. All it costs actually is just a little bit of your attention uh, on this random Friday morning in March. The story I'm going to tell you is about the day when I was sitting alone in an empty office on the third floor of Ken Olson and my phone rang with an unknown number. I picked it up and I heard on the other end of the line, the voice of Brad Stevens, the head coach of the Boston Celtics. That's where we're gonna end the story, but I wanna rewind a little bit, tell you how I got there, tell you the journey. Uh, so I wanna go back to the time when my friend sent me that poem. As I mentioned, this was in January of 2017, and I was completely, totally, unabashedly stuck. It was one of those life moments when you just feel stuck in a problem and you don't know how to get out of it. I was a doctoral student at Boston College at the time, and I'd chosen a dissertation topic. Choosing a topic can be really nerve wracking. It's a thing you're gonna live with for multiple years and you're gonna get really involved with it, uh, know its ins and outs, wake up to it every morning. I would imagine it's a bit like choosing college. Um, you're making a long-term commitment. You know you're making it. And at a certain point, you just have to jump. So it can be nerve wracking, it was nerve wracking, but I was past that point. I'd chosen a dissertation topic and I knew I had a good topic. There's a reason I knew it was a good topic. Um, I knew it because of my mother-in-law. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a quick story about my mother-in-law. I picked her up uh, from the airport. She lives in Texas and she was flying in to visit us. Uh, this was right around that time, January, 2017. And I picked her up at the airport and Nochi, that's what we call her, not her real name, but Nochi could talk to a brick wall for half an hour. So I didn't expect on the ride back home that I would have to do much conversational legwork. Uh, we were driving back to the North Shore. Everything was going according to plan, but somewhere along Route 128, Nochi surprised me. She asked me about my topic. I gave a canned response. You get pretty used to getting the question. You get pretty used to giving a canned response. So I said exactly this. I want to study how high profile athletic success can be leveraged to benefit an entire university. It's the kind of response you give when you're feeling the other person out and you wanna see if they really care or not, if they were just being nice with one initial question. I'm pleased to report that Nochi is a saint. She really cared and so she asked the natural follow-up question. What does that even mean? I said, well, okay, do you know March Madness? She said, sure, I know March Madness, most people do. I said, okay, well, every year, March Madness rolls around and a Cinderella story starts getting written. There's some underdog team that suddenly wins a couple games. No one saw it coming. They score a couple upsets. Maybe they do it in dramatic fashion, a buzzer beater. Maybe they have a really wonderful player, really magnetic personality, something that draws us to their story. And the more games they keep winning, the longer they stay in the tournament, the more we pay attention. We start Googling them, tweeting about them, reading some stories hearing the broadcast coverage about the school, the institution. What happens is that these Cinderella stories draw a lot of attention. And they draw a lot of attention for the name across the front of the jersey, which is the institution back home where these players come from. People get curious about it. They wanna know, where, where is this coming from? Tell me more about the story. I wanna know, we love underdogs. And that creates an enormous opportunity for a university. And there's good evidence to suggest that that opportunity extends across campus to things like admissions, fundraising, <clears throat> donor relations, alumni relations, marketing, all sorts of stuff that this one special moment in the life of an institution opens a window for that institution to capitalize. So I told Noji, that's what I want to really dive into. I want to pick one institution and I want to study them. And I want to figure out what they've done with that Cinderella story in the years afterwards. And Nochi goes, oh, oh, oh. 
And I knew, I knew from her response that something had clicked. She goes, oh, like Gonzola. And I said, yes, I was super excited. I kind of ignored the fact that she had conflated a Jesuit school with an Italian cheese. Uh, and I understand that joke maybe only makes sense to five people, but those five people probably loved it. Like Gonzaga, yes. No, she had proved my point, which is as a total non-college basketball fan, she knew about Gonzaga University sort of because of their men's basketball team, because of the Cinderella story. They had gotten on her radar. And that's often the first step to so many of the relationships that colleges and universities are trying to form with external audiences. I knew, I knew when Nochi responded in that way that my topic had legs, that it was a good topic and there was something to dive into there. The reason though that I was stuck in January of 2017 is because I had chosen to study that other school that you see in the picture there, Butler. And I was stuck because I did not know a soul at Butler University. I didn't even know a person who knew a person at Butler. I had nothing and I didn't know how to find my way there. There was another thing that kind of compounded the problem pretty deeply for me. And that was the guy who's looming in the background of this picture, just off, <laughs> oddly enough, Kelly Olenek's backside there. Uh, you can see his face, you might recognize him. People up here certainly do recognize him because whenever I would tell people, yeah, I wanna study Butler University, their very next question to me, one that I came to grow very annoyed with was, oh, are you gonna talk to Brad Stevens? Brad Stevens had been the coach in 2010 and 2011 when Butler made back-to-back -back runs to the national championship game. And then he had come to the Boston Celtics. So people knew Butler because they knew Brad Stevens. They asked me, I guess a knee-jerk reaction, are you going to talk to him? As if I could just dial up the Celtics and talk to their head coach anytime I want. It seemed to trivialize this thing that to me felt really hard. The reality was that I wanted to talk to anyone affiliated with Butler. So on the one hand, Brad Stevens was the furthest thing from my mind. On the other hand, he was never all that far from my mind. He was always kind of looming there in the background, mainly because I kept getting that question. And the problem, the real problem with that question was that it raised a hope I didn't want to admit to having because I was afraid of failing, which is I really did want to find a way to talk to him. Worst of all, it raised this prospect in my mind that if I went to all this trouble to do a dissertation, uh, spent so much time visiting Butler, interviewing people after I even found my way there, writing tens of thousands of words, crunching data, writing data, writing all of this effort. And I didn't interview him, one of the principal characters in the story, that people would look at the final product and say it was incomplete, that it wasn't good enough. And I knew that was gnawing at me in the back of my mind every time people jumped to that question as soon as they heard the word Butler. Without making the connection at the time, I had become that someone in the John Ashbery poem who was traveling furiously in a certain direction and not knowing what was gonna happen if or when I got there. Well, I've already previewed the, the, the ending here. I did find a way there. So see if you can follow my path here a little bit. I told you I didn't know anyone at Butler. So I did what I think is a reasonable thing to do. I started in my backyard. Uh, I started with somebody I did kind of know. I was at BC, so I reached out to the AD there at the time, his name was Brad Bates, and I scheduled a meeting with him. I said, Brad, do you know Butler's athletic director? His name's Barry Collier. Uh, I'm hoping you can reach out on my behalf. Brad did not know Barry Collier, but he did offer to reach out. Uh, I thought, okay, this is my best chance. I just need someone uh, significant at Butler to say, come on down, you can study. You can do your dissertation here, and then I can be off and running. Brad reached out to Barry. I ended up waiting a couple months until I finally heard the word back. Yes, here's the contact information. So I reached out to Barry. No response. Called Barry. Got in touch with him. He said, yeah, sure. Come on down. So at that point, I felt like I had permission. I scheduled a trip to Indianapolis, where Butler is. I started cold emailing people in the community that I thought would be good to interview and saying, hey, Barry Collier said I could come. I'm coming. Can we talk? The very first person to respond to my cold email was a guy named Jim Danko, who happens to be the president at Butler. It was the first response I got. Made me feel really good about this idea that, yeah, this might actually work. 
So I took a trip to Butler. This was April of 2017, and I started interviewing people. I interviewed President Danko, and one of the things you do when you're interviewing is it's called the snowball method, snowball sampling. At the end of the interview, you just say, hey, is there anyone else I should talk to? President Danko said, yes, there is a guy, a former chair of our board who loves to talk about this topic. His name is John Hargrove. You should reach out to him. So I did. I emailed. I ended up calling John um, parked in my car right by Koi Pond out back here at Frost. And I thought I was just calling to set up a time when I could interview him. And then it turned into an impromptu interview. And he talked for an hour and I was feverishly scribbling. And then I said, hey, could we do that again? Because I kind of wanted to record it. And he said, sure, I'm going to be running a marathon on the Cape over the summer. Come on down there and we'll talk. So I did. I went down to the Cape, met John in a coffee house. Um, and at a certain point, he said, oh, I teach a course um, or, or I teach some sessions at the Harvard Kennedy School on occasion. And, and often Tracy Stevens will join me. Tracy is, is Brad's wife. And he said, uh, I think she'd be willing to talk to you. And I said, oh, really? You think she would? And he said, yeah, sure. And I said, okay, well, how do I get in touch with her? I can still remember him kind of looking around the coffee house, fiddling with his phone, looking again, and then very surreptitiously holding that phone up so I could see an email address. I copied down the email address. I emailed Tracy right away. No response. I tried again, I think, I'm not even sure, pretty sure I tried again, no response. And so I gave up. I didn't wanna be a bother and I imagine that the demands on her time are so great and overwhelming um, and I just didn't wanna bother. So I carried on about my business. I went back to Butler one more time, October 2017 and I was interviewing Barry Collier again. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna take one more swing at this. So I said at the end of our interview, hey Barry, I had emailed Tracy and uh, I didn't hear anything back. Do you think I should try again or should I just leave it alone? He said, huh, that's weird. She's very responsive about that kind of stuff. Let me see what I can do. And sure enough, you probably believe this never happens, but it really did to me. It was weird. My email had gone right into her spam folder um, and she never knew about it. She got right back to me and said, sure, let's meet. Uh, so we set up a time to meet later that month. Uh, in October 2017, down at a coffee house uh, in Wellesley. Here it is. This is where we met. I got there super early the morning of that meeting. I was super nervous. Um, and so I got there. I was going rifling through my interview questions, making sure I had all my ducks in a row. I was scouting out the location. Are there seats? Where do we sit? What's this going to look like? I was trying to imagine it in my head. Um, the other thing I was trying to do was figure out how to set the right tone. So I knew on the one hand that Tracy was my best and last hope to talk to Brad and alleviate this pressure um, that I was feeling and probably mostly putting on myself, but that was nonetheless there. That was my best and last hope uh, to do this. I also really wanted to talk to Tracy on her own terms, to talk to her. Uh, she had as much insight as anyone else I talked to into the story I was trying to understand and tell. She had lived it. She was a current Butler trustee, so it made a lot of sense to be talking to her. She was, uh, as I dug around and figured out, a former labor and employment attorney. She had done some negotiating work uh, for some of Brad's contracts. All of this was super cool to me, and I wanted to just talk to Tracy to talk to Tracy. And I had no clue how to strike that right balance. Um, I had no clue how to do the interview and then make that ask that I so desperately wanted to make. As I was trying to figure this out in my head, time essentially ran out, I had to go. I walked into the coffee shop, super nervous, feeling unprepared, not knowing even what Tracy looked like. Would I find her? Would, would we have this awkward interaction to kick things off and it would just go all downhill from there? She walked in and I will never for, forget what she did. We get in line, we order our drinks. She's immediately warm, I order a chai tea latte, a hot one. And she says, I'll have the same thing. I will never forget that. Immediately I thought, huh, huh, nice. My drink order must be good. I must have ordered the right thing. I started to feel at home. We sat down at one of these booths you see here. She started sipping the chai. She said, ah, this drink makes me feel so happy. And she settled right in as if she had nowhere else in the world to be. And I knew that couldn't be further from the truth. I knew that life must be hectic. The schedule must be super demanding. 
And yet she made me feel like this was the only spot to be. It was an extraordinary act of grace. Um, I think she probably knew she was giving it, but I felt it strongly regardless. She ended in some of, some of the best quotes I found in all my research, maybe the best quote. Over the course of our conversation, she ended up talking to me for an hour. There was something that started to dawn on me. It was about the second or third time uh, she made a comment that stood out to me. I said, hey, wait a second, what's going on here? She said, after telling a particular story, well, you can ask Brad about that when you talk to him. And slowly, slowly, because I'm thick headed up here, it dawned on me that I wasn't even gonna have to make that ask that I was dreading, that it was just gonna happen, <laughs> that something broke in my favor. Uh, so at the end of the conversation, she checks her phone. She says, oh yeah, okay, he's gonna call you 2 p.m. today. It'll probably come in as a private number of Boston Celtics, but pick it up, 2 p.m. today. And I probably fumbled and said, oh, thank you so much. And we parted ways. But I remember getting to my car and being absolutely floored for one reason, because I knew the Spurs were in town. They had a game that night, the Celtics did. They had a game against a really good organization, against one of the greatest coaches of all time, Greg Popovich. I didn't really feel like I was the best pregame routine for anyone to be taking at that point. So I was stunned that he'd be calling me on a game day. And I was also stunned that it was going to be that very day. I was not prepared at all. I got in my car. I had no interview questions. So I raced back to Gordon's campus, thinking up interview questions on the fly. I get back here. I grab a little lunch. And I think, oh, I got to find a space where I'm absolutely sure I won't be interrupted, where I'll be able to hear him, where there's no connection problems. I fuss over that. I find my way up to Ken Olson to a vacant office on the third floor. I settle back into that office. Uh, I'm looking at my interview questions. Phone rings. There it is. The unknown number. I pick it up. Jerry, this is Brad Stevens. How are you? We spoke for just 15 minutes. Um, I don't remember much. I have the transcript, except thinking that, huh, this guy must answer interview questions for a living. Everything was so smooth and polished, helpful, but right to the point. Um, I remember being deeply impressed by that and then dying on me. Well, yeah, he's had a lot of practice. The thing I remember most though is that we got off the call and I felt immediately so drained. I was just wiped out. I'm an introvert, so being with people, being on, really drains me. And I felt it, especially because that journey had felt so long to get to that point. A point I probably didn't even need to get to, but that I had felt like I needed to get to. I felt wiped out. I looked at my schedule for the rest of the day and something, something else dawned on me. I said, oh no, what have I done? At this point, you should know, I do on occasion teach a course here called Gordon After Dark. And the course is basically comprised uh, of events on campus. We go to them in normal times. We attend them, um, theater performances, lectures, jazz ensembles, all that sort of thing. And then we talk about them. And that's the nature of the course. And I had scheduled an event for that night. I had scheduled a poetry reading, seven o'clock over in Gregory Auditorium. And I was kicking myself. I thought of a million different ways to try to get out of it. I don't have to go. I'm the teacher. I don't need to do that. Uh, yeah, that probably is the reason you definitely need to do that. I tried to come to terms with this. I never really did, but seven o'clock rolled around. I stumbled over to the auditorium. I sunk in the back row, as far back as I could get, in the corner of the room, wiped out, exhausted, to no mental energy left to give. Started scrolling on my phone. You've seen that pose all the time. Until the poet was introduced. He got up to the podium. Uh, his name was Michal Oshio. I skipped Brad. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have done that. This is Michal. Irish guy, older windblown, scruffy, looked like a writer. And he didn't take long to get to his point. One of the very first things he said within five minutes of starting was, I won't patronize youth. He was looking out across an auditorium full of mostly of 18 to 22 year olds. And he said, you can imagine the passing of a spouse. And I snapped to attention. I've been married for almost a decade at the point. And I said, yes, I can imagine that. When my mind goes to those dark places, that's one of them. Um, that kind of self-defense thing for, for something you could never actually defend against if it ever happened. I've been there. It doesn't take much imagination. I get it. 
what also struck me and snapped me to attention was the courage it took to stand up in front of a room full of strangers and immediately go to this place. So suddenly my attention was roused. Uh, and I knew just down the road, Celtics playing the Spurs, lots of eyeballs on that. In this tiny room, this tiny campus in a corner of New England, with just maybe a hundred people in the room, something important was going to happen. Michal proceeded to read his poems about his wife, some from when she had been alive, some from when she had been sick, some from after she had passed. And in between poems, he shared secrets. He shared this one. But the only way he could cope being gratitude I was stunned at this kind of response. I said, hmm, I'm gonna have to think more about that. He started sharing some poems about jazz. He said this. He talked about the God of surprises and how jazz always took him to that place, reminding him that the God of surprises could take over. I was fully attentive that whole hour. I was locked in. I had attention I didn't know I had until he brought it out of me. And when I got in my car uh, at the end of the day, I drove home in the quiet of that car and was reflecting on that day. I started to chuckle because I could see a real lasting surprise taking root. It had been a day full of surprises, but the biggest one, I knew it right then, the biggest one was that Tracy and Brad Stevens would forever be tied in my head to, of all people, Michal Oshiel. I couldn't shake that old poet who had traveled across an ocean of grief, landed on my doorstep, and given the thing he had for me, for all of us, for any of us who had stumbled into that room. It was a grace note at the end of a long full day. And more than three years later, it still is. I wanna show you the rest of that poem now. Here's the second stanza. I'm gonna read the full thing to you. Somewhere, someone is traveling furiously toward you at incredible speed, traveling day and night through blizzards and desert heat, across torrents, through narrow passes. But will he know where to find you, recognize you when he sees you, give you the thing he has for you? Hardly anything grows here, yet the granaries are bursting with meal, the sacks of meal piled to the rafters, the streams run with sweetness, fattened fish, birds darken the sky. Is it enough that the dish of milk is set out at night, that we think of him sometimes, sometimes and always, with mixed feelings? I love this poem because it reminds me that at any given moment, we are on a web of collision courses with more people than we ever imagined. Some of them we see coming, many of them we don't. It's exceedingly rare though that we ever really understand what it took for someone to get to us and that they ever really understand what it took for us to get to them. So much of our journeys are hidden from one another. I know that when I read this poem. But this poem also has questions. It makes me think of what we actually have to offer those moments when we do finally intersect. But at long last, after whatever we've traveled through, we come in front of each other, face to face, voice to voice. We hear and listen to each other. We have an opportunity. <clears throat> I try to teach this poem in class. I fail, I'm sure of it, um, because I can never quite articulate what it means to me. Yet here I am trying again. But just a couple of weeks ago, I was teaching this poem in class and someone brought up something I'd never seen before. And it's that there's only one line in this poem uh, that is unpunctuated at the end. You can find it in the second stanza. It's the one that ends with, is it enough? It's open-ended, no punctuation. And I find that that's the question from this poem that haunts me the most when I think about how I interact with others. Is it enough? Have I offered enough? Enough what? For me, that's attention. That's how I define my relationships. Have I offered enough attention when we do finally meet? It's an open-ended question. Most times I don't have the answers. But I do want to focus this morning on how we can give each other our best attention, how we can better answer that, be prepared to answer that question of whether it was enough. And this morning I want to suggest to you 
that one reason, or excuse me, one solution to that question is to open ourselves up to the God of surprises. And since it's unclear to me, at least in that poem, how well the parties know each other in the poem, let me also suggest that an openness to surprise is just as important with those we love and know best as it is with total strangers. To demonstrate this, I want to reference one of my favorite podcasts here. Uh, it's called the Work Life Podcast. It's a TED podcast that Adam Grant does. Um, some of you may know Adam Grant. He's a pretty popular organizational psychologist at Wharton. He does these wonderful podcasts, Work Life Podcasts, on little hacks that different companies or people have figured out in the professional setting where they're doing things differently and doing it well, doing things counterintuitively. And one of the episodes in the first season is called How to Trust People You Don't Like. And that episode focuses on a story. It's a story of a crew of astronauts, three astronauts on the International Space Station. <clears throat> One's Italian, one's American, one's Russian. And the nature of the story is that they have this really difficult task to do. It's only been done once before. They have to grab a storage container hurtling through space with a giant robotic arm. And it's apparently really difficult. Um, I would imagine anything in space is difficult, but this is apparently extra difficult. It had only been done once before when they were attempting to do it. But there was a problem as they were readying to head up into space. And it was that there was some friction on the team. They had a really difficult task to do and a short time to prepare for it. And there was friction. And the nature of that friction was primarily cultural difference. The Italian, the American, the Russian, in particular, the friction between the American, who was a female, her name was Katie Coleman, and the Russian, who was named Dimitri, and as Katie puts it in the podcast, was a bit unused to astronauts being females. There were some real tensions between them. Early on when they were training, doing a simulation in the capsule, Katie had been doing a calculation, figuring out how much fuel they had left or something like that. And she wrote it down on a piece of paper and held it up for Dimitri to see. And he kind of just pushed it off to the side. When they were debriefing, they realized, Dimitri and the other astronaut, Paolo, the Italian, that they had gotten the calculation wrong and that she had gotten it right. And that was a breakthrough moment for Dimitri with Katie. He saw that she was competent. She had been all along. Just to be an astronaut, you have to be extraordinarily competent. It was there all along, but he wasn't willing to see it until it forced its way into his perspective. He saw her competence and that changed everything for him. He said to her, from now on, you do the calculations. For Katie, she had to see something else in Dimitri. Uh, she felt like she, she had not been seen correctly and she was right. Uh, and so for her to learn to trust Dimitri, the breakthrough moment was actually not at work. It was when they were in their uh, living quarters and their families were there and she saw Dimitri playing ping pong with his young son. She had to see his character. She had to see him outside of the work setting to realize that he was trustworthy. And at the end of this wonderful podcast, uh, there's a great quote. Katie says, whether you were the crew going to Mars or you were the crew in your house as a family, the way to really get the most out of the people on your team is to never stop looking, looking at each other and letting each other surprise you. There's one more book I wanna talk about quickly here uh, by an author and designer named Ingrid Fratell Lee. She's talking the book's called Joyful. She's talking about things, physical objects in our lives that surprise us, um, that bring us joy, that routinely, dependably in some ways, can provide us with joy, which we tend to think of as pretty fleeting. That's true, but there are also ways that we can position ourselves better to find joy. She talks about a lot of different aesthetics, about objects that can bring us joy. And one of those aesthetics is the surprise aesthetic. When objects surprise us, they bring us joy. She has this wonderful quote, keep in mind, she's talking about physical objects, um, your favorite pair of jeans, that old basketball you tuck under your arm, a hoodie, a book, a movie, whatever it might be. But she says when she's talking about surprise, the surprise aesthetic can be a tool for cultivating a more emotionally sustainable relationship with our things. When the objects in our lives continue to surprise us, we don't want to trade them for new ones. We rediscover their joy again and again, 
and we fall a bit more in love every time. <clears throat> it's probably important to distinguish that there are bad surprises. <laughs> this pandemic was a bad surprise. We're living in the middle of one right now and there are good surprises. And the way that Ingrid talks about good surprises is to call them an unexpected welcome. Something we were subconsciously looking for, um, but didn't really realize it until it smacked us across the face. I'm gonna to suggest to you that the way she talks about objects in this quote, that we fall a bit more in love with them every time, even though we know them quite well, is almost directly applicable to our closest loved ones. And that when we figure out ways to keep seeing them again and again, to let them surprise us, we fall in love a bit more every time. We don't wanna trade them in for new ones. We want the old ones, the ones that have been there all along. The wonderful thing about surprise is that by God's grace, it can work in such a way that it will find us even when we're not looking for it. Surprise can be a poem sent out of the blue from a friend, a second question from your mother-in-law when you were only expecting one, a commonality as simple and warm as a latte, 15 minutes on a day when something else really big is going on. A moment of vulnerability from a total stranger. I find that lots of surprises in my life are quite small, but if I'll let them, they flood me with something much larger. The tricky part about surprise is that by its nature, it cannot be manufactured. We can't force it, we can't conjure it, we can't ever say for certain when, where, or how it will appear. What we can do is trust that it will show up. We can put ourselves in positions where it is more likely to show up and we can keep our minds and hearts open to that appearance. Over time, surprise can, can, become, can become a reliable way to find God. Michal O'Shiel and Jazz, remember this quote, Jazz gives me hope that something will still surprise me, that the God of surprises will take over. And so he keeps going back to this piece of art that captivates him, that still surprises him even after all these years. I don't know much about jazz. Some people say it has a lot in common with basketball and I know a lot more about that. I've played a lot of games, watched countless more, written about it now, but still I keep coming back to that sport. Just two weeks from now, I will partake in my favorite tradition. Friday, March 19th, I will take the day off from work I will not pay attention to my email. I will silence my phone. At around 11.45, I will run to North Beverly to my favorite sub shop. I will get a Buffalo chicken calzone. I will take it home and I will park myself on the couch in front of the TV and watch 12 straight hours of basketball on the opening day of March Madness. I watch every year for the same thing. I don't know when, where or how, but I know that at some point, another Cinderella will show up and shock us all. Let me close this morning like I started with a confession. My favorite sports book of all time is not the one that Graham and I just wrote, as proud of it as we are. It's a book called Soccer and Sun and Shadow by Eduardo Galeano. I only like soccer okay, but I love the way that Galeano wrote about it with such nuance and passion and imagination. The book's essentially a meditation on the beauty and possibility of the game and the many ways over the years in which greed and consumerism and unhealthy views of competition and winning have corrupted that game. But Galliano just can't quit soccer. He loves it too much. <clears throat> After this wonderful depiction, my copy is 200 some odd pages of all the sun and shadow of the sport, of all the dark days and surprising turns. He concludes with this. Soccer never stops being astonishing. That's the best thing about it. It's stubborn capacity for surprise. I think that's true of all sports. And I think it's true of people too. If we open up to those who find their way to our doorstep, I'm convinced the God of surprises will waltz right on through beside them. 
Now let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for another morning. We thank you for a day fresh with possibility. We ask that you would help us to see you in new ways, to see you in surprising ways in old areas of life, to look at people a little differently, to allow them to surprise us, change our posture so that we're open to finding you in these spaces and help us when we do find you to let that surprise flood every part of our being, make us better, make us pay more attention to ourselves and our own needs, pay more attention to the needs of others around us. Prepare us for those moments we don't know that are coming and help us to respond well when they do come. We're grateful for, our, for all that you've given and ask that you would help us to steward those gifts well. Pray this in Christ's name, amen.